good morning, good afternoon, and good night. I am your podcast host, Danny Vicent, and this is Coffee and Conversations, a place where we explore topics in technology, leadership, and innovation, discussions about things that are keeping you up at night with industry experts, technology experts, and so much more. So grab your cup of coffee and join us as we dive in. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good night. Thank you for joining another episode of Coffee and Conversations. And as you guys know, I have a very inquisitive nature. Uh, And one thing that sparks my passion more than any uh, is education. Seeing that creativity and that inspiration given to to people wanting to to learn is something that just gets me going. And today I'm very happy. Uh, We've got two new faces on the podcast, and they are all about education. So I'm going to have them introduce themselves, and then we're going to jump into it. I promise you guys are going to be inter- entertained. Uh, Mary, why don't we start with you? Yeah, thank you. And thank you so much for having me on today. My name is Mary Slugamilk, and I lead business development for education for Cisco Systems. Um, but I am an educator true and true. It is my passion. I, I left and came to Cisco. I left the education uh, position to come to Cisco about 13 years ago from a K-12 district. But I continued my work in a higher ed as well. I mean, I... I, my passion is education. So our conversation today, I'm super excited about. And a, a friend and colleague that I have met through my job here at Cisco is our other guest. So Kathy, you want to introduce yourself? I'm excited to. Um, thank you. And uh, Mary and Danny, thank you both for doing this. I have to agree. My passion is also education, K-12 education. My dad was a teacher. My sister's a teacher. Um, I go actually attended the same school district that I am now supporting. And uh, one of my favorite things to always do is to um, work with the teachers and find out how to make things work better for them. So um, while I, people, you say you're in education, they say, oh, what do you teach? I say, I teach teachers. That is my job. I also get the benefit quite often of being able to teach students uh, because sometimes they are also need some of that uh, guidance um, and the teacher asks me to step in. So uh, I've been doing it for, I've been working for the district for over 20 years. Uh, We started with no technology whatsoever. I came in in a project where we were putting technology in, phone in every classroom and a laptop in every teacher's hands with uh, workstations for students, computer labs. We're now completely wireless. Students are now using their mobile phones. Um, So it's been a big, big transition. That's very cool. I guess it, I guess that takes away from the losing my homework or my dog ate my homework when it's all on your cell phones and digital. That's pretty cool. <laughs> it does. It does. It's it's now more of a well. I know I I created it, but it it must the file got deleted. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Mary, I do I do have to ask you something before we jump into it, and 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 it's something I've heard a lot. Um, but can you tell me what what is it? What is the to power and inclusive learning? What, what does that mean um, and, and why is it so important to offer flexible uh, options to our teachers and students? Uh, so power inclusive learning for all is so important as we think from an educator's background of what is the needs and the capabilities that we need within a system, a school system, to provide everything that teachers and students and staff need. So I think about in today's terms, it's about the network. We need to have a secure simple network that's easy to manage. Again, that goes with the simplicity and the security, of course, but also it creates that user experience so that teachers have at the ready that access to the applications and the computing power that they need, but also students have that. And so I think that that is one of the things here at Cisco, you know, that a lot of people think, oh, Cisco, an education company? Well, again, we were born within an education environment at Stanford University, you know, and so I always think it's about the power of the network. And when you have a powerful and strong network that can, you know, be secure and give everything that it needs to do for the various applications within the district, that is the power. That's awesome. That's awesome. Folks, I'm going to remind you now before I forget later, and that is that you take advantage of the links down below. As normal, we have several links down there that talk about all the things that we're going to talk about today. And inevitably, when you have questions, because 
If you're like me, you're probably going to have 100 questions when this is all done. There's always the ask us anything. And Mary has said she's going to stay up all weekend answering those questions. Whole time. <laughs> so let's make sure we get them to her. No, I'm kidding. But that, yeah, definitely submit those questions if you have them. Um, Kathy, I, I do have to ask you now, what, what type of experiences are you trying to create to help? I mean, you talked about teaching both students and teachers. So, so what are you doing there to help them in, in their efforts? Uh, well, it, it can be just about anything. It can be all the way from people that um, don't understand that a cell phone is a computer and how they can be mobile that instead of being tethered to a laptop, um, all the way to teaching those advanced um, features that are available uh, with regard to using whiteboards and annotations and um, being able to uh, share different types of audio. So my my biggest goal is to make it easy uh, to help them at the level that they're ready for because while they at the currently again it might be somebody who doesn't understand that what you have on your computer is the exact same thing you have available on your phone which means i've got to start off on the basics get them comfortable with that and help them move on but with that said a lot of my goal is to work with those teachers that are more advanced give them the information and then once those teachers that weren't as comfortable because they won't all come back to me sure that they'll go and they'll talk to their peers so yeah. the more i can kind of interject with different people the more i um, spread the knowledge i'm one of those don't ever keep knowledge to yourself spread it out make sure that as many people as possible know about it um, there's no harm in sharing it uh, it's, it's, i heard a phrase a long time ago that um, you don't want to pull your watch out all the time and tell everybody what you know, but you've got to be able to prepare to pull that watch out and give them the time when they want it at the appropriate times. And that's my goal. Give them the knowledge when they're ready for it and let them give them the, um, the confidence to build on it themselves. I love that. I love that. So I, I'm going to ask now, now if we're going to go back in time a little bit. I know that sounds crazy, but we're going to go back a little bit before even the pandemic, because I know you were exploring various collaboration tools even prior to that. Um, what, tell me, why, why did you end up landing with WebEx and what type of, of collaborative features were you looking for, or video features were you looking for? Well, at the time, we were actually phasing out an old phone system and we needed a new phone system. Um, and one of the functions we needed with that was we wanted the availability to have virtual meetings. We at that time were not thinking of them with education necessarily. Um, we were thinking about uh, possibly having students and uh, staff join cl classes other people were hosting. We weren't thinking about hosting them. With that said, we put in phone systems, had those all ready to go, and then in January, February, March of 2020 is when we started rolling out the WebEx features. Um, we fo focused more on, at the time, Jabber calling um, and the messaging it had available. So we kind of focused on that and gave them a little bit of information about the, the WebEx meeting features. Well, uh, as everybody knows, in March of 2020, we had to completely shift. We immediately started rolling it out and I had three weeks to create documentation, schedule a whole bunch of classes uh, for all of those staff so that they could be up and running and teaching what virtually as soon as we had a three week spring break, as soon as spring break was over. <laughs> I love that. Uh, so, folks, this is once again just a reminder of those links down below. Please do click them, um, and let's uh, let's keep Mary busy with all those questions. And I keep saying that, and I hope Mary, you know, I'm just kidding. We're going to all take care of those. I don't want you thinking, "Oh my gosh, she's sending me all these questions." <laughs> Uh, I do. Absolutely. I do want to ask you something, Mary. Um, you've partnered with Kathy for a long time, so so you know that that Colorado Springs District 11 has always kind of been ahead of the curve. But I, I hear a story. I've heard a story, shall I say, that something that you did to ensure um, that they had the skill set necessary in this hybrid environment. Can can you can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So again, let's go back to when Kathy and I first met. It was definitely pre-pandemic. Um, when she was looking at a platform in which she needed a way in which to message um with the with the faculty you know how can they message each other quickly and have that communication platform but then also then if they did want to have a, a virtual meeting you know what were those plans of how to use that and it's going to be mostly for professional development so um, with part of my position here at cisco is to help 
um, the school districts and the faculty really understand how how to work this and from a train the trainer model you know as an educator myself and this is what I use every day within my my um, when I was teaching college classes but also when I was with the district you know how do you use those collabor collaboration platforms and really understand the use cases and so when we could talk peer-to-peer -peer, professional development use cases and you know like getting all the third grade teachers from the district together without having them drive to that central location because you know that is really um it's it, it really disrupts a teacher's schedule with their family as well sure. when you say oh after school now you're going to have a third grade all the third grade teachers are going to get together well, they have children that they want to pick up from daycare or from school. They want to get home. And so we have to think differently. And that's kind of what we were doing is I was helping her think of all those various use cases. And then the pandemic happened, right? We were hearing, okay, March, it's going to all shut down. And it really did. And so quickly, the Cisco team, myself and others, we decided that we should be having um, quick one hour training sessions for teachers all over the world. And we did them almost every other hour, starting super early in the morning so we could grab the teachers in Italy because the entire school system within Italy quickly adopted WebEx. But how could we grab teachers that were gonna be in other um, areas of Europe as well? We did not know that you know some of the teachers in the Middle East would be staying up to, to join as well. And then we started through the time zones of the US, ending up all the way into the evening, about six and seven o'clock at night, um, helping service the teachers in Australia, New Zealand. And of course, in the providence of um, um, Victoria within Australia, they had you know, bought in to WebEx as well for all teachers. And so we just quickly, as a team, said, how can we help districts really understand the power of remote learning. You know, we'd always talked about blended and, and more of a hybrid when you were bringing in maybe a, um, you know, a subject matter expert from across, you know, a boundary to come into your classroom. But now it was time for us to talk about true remote synchronous education. And that's where WebEx really can shine. And that's how Kathy then started coming. And I'm thinking, well, Kathy, we were just meeting all last fall. You should be good. And she's like, oh, I'm not the only one here, Mary. And I started looking at the emails of everybody registered. And I'm like, yep, there's Colorado D11. There's another D11 teacher. There's another D11 teacher. That's awesome. And, I, and you know, they just kept coming back. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I thought it was very interesting. And they said, well, remember, we can only take so much at a time. And and in one hour, you packed so much information into that. And I thought, well, yeah, and you're getting the recording. And she's like, yeah, but we also like to just come and ask questions in real life. <laughs> and so, again, that's the power of teaching live synchronous, right? Yeah. I love it. I, I absolutely love it. So, so Kathy, there, there's, a, there's something that, uh, you know, I, I never heard pre-pandemic, but now I hear it all the time, and that is the new normal. And so I'm going to ask you, what what are some of these solutions that that you're using that have now become that new normal? And and how how are we preparing our students for the future using those solutions? Okay, so well, um, the new normal is basically anything goes. If you can think it, and it works multiple times, then you keep going. Our new normal is that we now have two truly online schools. Um, both of them are thriving. They're getting new students all the time. Parents love it because uh, in some cases it's supplementing homeschooling. In some cases, um, it just made sense for them to not have to get their students somewhere. They wanted them to get the same social feeds and the same education as uh, other public schools, but not have to transport their students somewhere. Um, it gives them the flexibility of being able to still, still spend time with their kids, monitor them, be more engaged with them. So with the new normal on that is also, we are in integrating more and more video um, learning in the classrooms. We have some teachers that have students from other schools that attend their classes. We would oh, never wow. have done that before. Um, and we're looking at really 
um, moving forward and making that even more and more available going forward. We, every single one of our high schools has early college classes available, but those um, early college teachers are usually fairly unique. So if you've got an early college teacher at one school, we may not have another subject matter or teacher in that class anywhere else. To be able to offer that to all of our students instead of just the students that attend that school is really, really powerful for us. Um, it's really, it's going to help the students. It's going to make them achieve more. It's going to give them that leverage, that leg up that they're going to need when they move on, because they'll have that additional experience, the, uh, not only the additional experience with the teacher in the class, they're going to have it with the, the technology. So walking into any business, they'll be much more comfortable working with that company, no matter what the format is for that company. So it's really going to give them the additional um, expertise, not only in the classes that they're taking and the credits that they're going to get for it, but also in those skills that they're going to need to succeed going forward. And, you know, Danny, I'm going to interject here because yeah, I think do. this is really important to think, too, about, you know, and Colorado is where Kathy is, right? And, you know, you have to think about mountainous roads, you have to think about weather. And so now there's different options of how students can attend class. I'm in Nebraska and, you know, we consider these rural states or the flyover states as we needed to do, um, you know, distance education because it was of necessity to share highly qualified teachers between schools. Yeah. That was a, a norm for many, many years. And, and many of us just didn't see the, the power of that norm especially on the coast side until after the pandemic happened and then it just opened the eyes of hybrid work as well as hybrid teaching and learning. So now many of our parents, they have the option of hybrid work that they never would have had if it wasn't for that unfortunate pandemic that happened. And so now they're saying, well, can we have that same option for our children and Absolutely. give us a little bit more flexibility and how we can have our family life structured as well. Love it. Well, and thank you for interjecting because you actually just prompted a question in, in my head. And 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 so mm -hmm. so as, as you talked about that, Mary, it, it actually, Kathy, I have a question, and that is about your district itself. So okay. I'm sure a lot of people listening are thinking Colorado Springs, and they're picturing a town or city in their head. And that may not be exactly the scope of what your district covers. And so could you just talk a little bit about the size, the scope of your district? Um, certainly. Um, we are a very diverse district. We are a inner city district of Colorado Springs. I you know I don't know what the current population is, but it's got to be close to 600, 700,000. We are the central part of Colorado Springs, uh, and we have a very we we have a very diverse um, student population and a diverse ge geography because we do have uh, a. The elevation range is about a thousand feet in between, so we can get be having snow on one side of town and no snow on the other side of town. Hills are all throughout it. Um, as far as the students go, we have a large uh, title one is uh, students that are uh, qualify for free and reduced lunches, which can means that they are lower socioeconomic. Some of our schools have a very very high. Um, uh, percentage of those other schools have a very low. I mean, again, it's, it's so, so diverse and it. By being able to offer this hybrid learning for those students, we're making it to where again, a student that may be in a lower socioeconomic area doesn't isn't necessarily tied to just the schools in that area. It used to be that if they couldn't drive somewhere, that's where they were had to stay. Now, with what we're opening up, we're making it to where it's more accessible to everybody. We also um, have provided for all of our students uh, the availability to check out a hotspot. They all have a, their own device. Um, we are checking out hotspots to them so that they can still also get that if they can't afford it in their own house or have access to internet, we're trying to make that available to them. Um, I had some very interesting conversations just recently at Cisco Live um, with several people where they were talking about adding additional autonomous um, vehicles and things and uh, additional wireless 
capability within school in within their cities and one of my suggestions to them is as they're talking about these bus riders that they want to be able to provide wi-fi for and everybody i'm like don't forget about those students and everybody that are at their home if you can make it to where while you're building that out you're also keeping those students and those families in mind that would be a huge benefit to your city because you're now making it again to where it's available for all but uh, those students and those families now have access. You're making it the equitable so that your teachers have access to it and your students uh, and parents do. It's very, very important and often overlooked that you just assume everybody has internet and they, they don't. Uh, Mary was mentioning in Nebraska, those rural areas, mm -hmm. they don't have it either. And it's uh, very difficult for some families to come up with the monies to pay for that. Uh, and so anything that we as a, as a society can do to help to make it again to where what is available for one, something, it, it used to be, you know, dial tone is your God given right. You now have internet is your God given right. It's kind of shifted a little bit. <laughs> well, and you make a really good point about that because, you know, we thought for many, many, the digital divide is just impacting students right but we really haven't thought about how is it impacting our staff you know not all of the staff and the faculty and i'm going to say staff and faculty because think about those that are working within the purchasing department the business offices of a district they many times have access to the internet at work and they haven't been afforded to have it or they didn't have the capability of having it at home so when we shifted to more of this hybrid environment um, or the remote environment during the pandemic, now school districts were starting to think about, it's not just our students, it's also our staff and our faculty that need access. I know of one district where they said, hey, we are gonna put outdoor hotspots, Wi-Fi in our parking lots. And so students, you know, as you come to town, parents are getting groceries, things like that, you can park in the parking lot to get access. Well, many times the teachers were right there as well. Um, because they didn't have access. So I say it's really about a community issue. And, and as we know, many of our services from both federal and state levels, we need to have access to be able to apply. So I encourage everybody, just don't look at the district about the digital divide. Let's bring it into the whole community and have the city and the community of the county working together with the school district to provide for everybody. I think that's really important. I agree. Well, well folks, I, I promise you'd be moved by some of this conversation. And if you're not moved yet, then I, I, I don't know what's going to get you. Um, uh, I do also want to remind you the links down below and please do get those questions in. Uh, we really do want to answer those. I don't want you walking away from this podcast uh, with anything on your mind. Okay, so Kathy, you know, something that you had mentioned there, talking about giving the students hotspots, giving them their devices, accessing from all these different places. Um, uh, you know, the tech guy in me is just screaming Okay, what about security? So, so I have to ask uh, about the security that we're, precautions we're taking in, in involved in that. Uh, well, when we picked WebEx, that was one of the big reasons why it was chosen, is we wanted to make sure that the data that from our students, our staff, that it was remained confidential, that there wouldn't be any data breaches, that it was um, secured, and so WebEx, provides that. We have a integration that automatically does all of our updates coming and it's coming from our active directory. So we've got to make sure that data is secure. It has personal information coming in about those students. We've got to make sure that any information that um, Cisco WebEx has remains confidential and that uh, it's not being made available or hackable by anybody on the systems. WebEx gives us our own domain that we use and it is unique to us. No other company or school district or anybody shares that domain with us. So we have our own secure settings on a server in the WebEx cloud. Um, they actually have different clusters for different companies and part of the reason they have those clusters is to help also to maintain that confidentiality um, and to make sure that uh, any data that is put up there is kept secure and unique and accessible only for those people that need it. Within Control Hub, we have it set up to where only uh, people that need access to different data have access to it. I'm actually administering that so that I've got 
some staff that they can administer devices, they don't get to see user accounts. They don't need to see that type of information. So not only am I keeping it secure from people outside of the district, I'm making sure that those people within the district only have access to what they need. All of that, diff those different levels of security and the uh, capabilities of personalizing it for each one is key to making sure that we keep compliant with government regulations and that nothing ever happens to compromise that data um, for any of our uh, staff or students or uh, parents, because in some cases we even have some parent information there. So it's, it's been very important to us. Well, I want to take it one step further too, is WebEx is secure at rest as well as in motion. And what I mean by that is as the data moves or the information, the video, the chat, whatever, as that moves up to the WebEx cloud, it is encrypted and moving encrypted. And when it comes down and is at rest, it is encrypted still. And the only people that have access to those encryption keys are those behind the firewall at the district level. Cisco doesn't even have access to them. You know, so we cannot get access to all of that personal identifiable information of students and things like that because we don't have the encryption key. And that's important to us here at Cisco. That's awesome. Okay, so I have been I've been biting my tongue this entire time because uh, you know I heard I heard a little birdie here, Kathy, that some students in your district got to talk to space. Now, when I was a kid, teachers mm -hmm. would wheel out a TV so I could watch something about NASA and space, but I never had that opportunity. So, so um, the Artemis One mission is the one that I'm talking about. Folks uh, on the on the call don't know, uh, but if you could talk about the what school was involved, how did they participate? What were some of the lessons learned for those students, and why was it so important? Because this is an incredible story. It was incredible. Um, we had, um, we started with one class and we ended up being able to invite quite a few more students from Jack Swigert Aerospace Academy. It's on the southeast side of town. It's close to Peterson Air Force Base. So there's a large military uh, student population there. So they have a strong, strong tie to the Air Force and now Space Force. Um, so when Mary approached me and asked if this was something I'd be interested in, I said, heck yes, let's let's get this going. And we reached out to a teacher there who um, is working, she's working on the more advanced science. Uh, and it's this is a middle school, so it always kind of amazes me the level of um, education of where the students are. My middle school, I sure as heck wasn't sitting there trying to figure out um, what some of the uh, orbits would be. She, so she was already teaching some of the, the science behind space travel and to be able to pull in the ability for them to join a WebEx meeting with astronauts. The astronauts were not on the Artemis. They were actually in a, a room right next to the command center in Texas. So they were right next to it, but the students joined those astronauts on Artemis using the Callisto system, which has WebEx built in. And so the astronauts were mark, replying back in WebEx, sharing things in WebEx, and it was not only sharing to those students, it was showing and displaying in the capsule at the same time. In that capsule, the, we could actually see the moon out the capsule window. So oh, this wow. was pretty much real time. It was it was amazing. It, it gives me goosebumps and I'm getting them again now because it was so exciting to be able to give them that opportunity and to give the teacher that opportunity to show them that what she is teaching them, um, how, where they can get to, um, what their, their goals could be in the future, but also to show them the power of it, that it's not limited. It's not limited to Earth anymore. It's, it's we're going out into the solar system and going on from there. Um, so the students were really excited to be participating in it and to be able to get their questions answered and to be able to talk to real astronauts. Um, I'm looking forward to the next phase where I really hope that um, we'll be able to um, also get some students to participate in that also because going forward this this is the future it's it's no longer remember as you mentioned i with you they wheeled the tv out and i sat there in the hall and i watched the moon landing yep 
Um, I, and that was just me watching. These were kids participating. They Amazing. were actually talking with the astronauts and getting their, quest their questions answered real time. And again, it was all being displayed in that capsule, which is uh, millions of miles away. It was amazing. And it's so important that it was a middle school, Danny. I mean, yeah. why, why did we really want to target middle schools? Is because this is when um, it's such an impressionable time for both girls and young men. You know, I'm going to say young ladies and young men, both. But we want to make that impression that technology and this type of study, this type of what is the education needed to be able to be part of that workforce for the future, it has to really start in the middle school years because in high school, it's almost too late. And so we wanted to make sure, I said, Kathy, I want one of your middle schools. And she says, well, we just happen to have Jack Swigert Aerospace Academy. And I says, oh, how, how so important awesome. is that, right? It's just really apropos, right? Um, so that was perfect. But, you know, and they, they were engaged. I mean, it was really exciting to see. Um, and I was remote. I thought, oh, I'm going to run out to Colorado and see this. And, and our Cisco team said, it's WebEx, Mary. You can stay right there in Nebraska and still participate. So That's I did. That's so awesome. That's so awesome. I mean, imagine the dreams and the limits that were removed in that time. That's just an incredible experience for those kids. I, that blows me away. Um, I, I do want to ask you, because you both mentioned future as you were describing that. And so as as you guys are thinking of, of the future of education, what what is your hope? What is your dream? What's What does the future of education look like? Uh, well, my hope for education is that it continues to be available for everybody at whatever they are comfortable with, but that we always um, try to stretch the limits and make sure that students, children aren't ever limited. They should never be told that they don't have access to something or that um, because of where they are, they're limited. Um, there should be none of those limitations. Um, so my my hope is that we continue to make it a, a level playing field for everybody to have access to it. Um, and that, as I mentioned, that they, no matter where they are, they can have access to it. So my, my hope within where I am working right now is to make it so that if we have students attending a school somewhere or, or or staying at home, that they have access to the same type of education and same resources, um, same tools as those students that are there in class themselves. There should be no limitations for any of those um, because if if there are the li the limitations should never be what we as a person thinks we have because if i i limit myself all the time i the only time i do well is when somebody pushes me that's what our teachers do is they give them that push um, and if we're not giving them the tools the access to the information um, and the resources and the the constant um again testing of limits then they're never they're not going to succeed we want them to be able to continue to succeed um, to be better than we are and to um, totally amaze us as they learn more and more and show us what they can do. Yeah, very, good. very good. And I think I would like to make sure that we use technology as a tool and not a means in which to educate. And that's because I truly do believe in the relationships that our teachers have with our students, whether in person or in a virtual environment because we have remote students or remote teachers. But I'd like to see that ability to truly use technology to help teachers personalize the learning environment for each and every student. Now, I'm a child of that personalized movement that didn't work so well because we didn't have the technology behind it. But now we have logistical ways in which we can use AI, machine learning, and know where are students at in the learning process and what do they need next and help a teacher by giving them those reports and saying hey you know this child is on this reading lesson or this english lesson for three days what do they need to do you know and, and where are they having problems and have it be truly an interactive piece in which the technology is helping students learn in a in a you know asynchronous format but yet the synchronous 
um, connection with highly qualified teachers. And I say this because I, I know that we're going to have to deal with the teacher shortage. We really, truly are. And so now it's time for us to think about asynchronous forms of technology and the reports going into or, or being provided to teachers that are on premise and then that are scheduling cohorts and re-cohorting students based on how they move through the curriculum. And, it, and people say, oh, Mary, that sounds like chaos. Well, I love organized chaos. Remember, I've been an educator, early childhood educator, kindergarten educator. You know, organized chaos is fantastic. But I also think we need to be using the technology to help our teachers with the tools that they truly need not be a burden to our teachers of how many applications do you got to do a report into because sure. they're not talking to each other. And so I always am I'm thinking differently about how we use high quality asynchronous educational tools to provide to teachers where students are in that personal and then they can create personal moments of learning or oh, let's cohort these 15 students from amongst a building and within our virtual environment and say, we need to step back and, you know, look at, you know, a particular unit so that you understand what's next. Again, personalize the environment, help teachers the most that, that we can. And I think if we really want to go back, I mean, let's look at the one-room schoolhouse or the two-room schoolhouse. Could you imagine if we had the logistical software available to really kind of coordinate. I mean, let's let's learn from our past and let's move a little bit away from this grade age based type of industrial model of education and truly help students move through at the pace they want to and need to, but keep the teachers at the forefront of being highly qualified and just have them be um, you know, those that are facilitating learning, not being the lecturers and just you know making sure kids stay within that assembly line that's that's my thinking mm -hmm. of the future i don't know if we'll get there um but i think I we like can it. i mean if amazon can take over retail and uber and lyft can take over transportation <laughs> i think we should be able to do something for educators there you go there you go what Mary, I find it interesting the way you talked about, though, going back to a one-room schoolhouse, because I think one of the benefits of a one-room schoolhouse was, like you said, letting them work through at their own pace, but it was also that ability for multiple age levels to work together. Um, and those multiple age levels, um, th this where we're headed with this ability for people to, or students to be able to take classes that fit their needs, we're going to get more and more to where we've got different age groups in there and they really that mentorship from age to yes. age can make a big difference i actually used to um tutor flute for, from middle school to high school and i learned more when i mentored when i did that teaching than i did from the teacher himself because it was a little bit more peer to peer and i was having to explain it to somebody else i think that's actually what's made me such a good um, tech yes. person in education because I have to take technical information and translate it over for teachers. Um, and you have to take it from a, the technical background into something that's a little, um, it, it, how do they use it? How do you make it personal? And the way you do that is I learned, I learned that skill from teaching people clear back in middle school and I use it going forward. And I see that a lot in classrooms. When you have classrooms, um, teachers don't like it as much. Well, actually, some teachers really do. When they have <laughs> third and fourth grade, and they really like it when they have, for instance, they have their first and second grade teachers, and then their second and third grade teachers, and they get to go with them a couple of years. And they yes. like it because they Looping. do have that mentorship. It's not just the teacher then. The teacher's teaching, facilitating, and leading. But really, the students are helping to, to enable all of that education process. That is a big, big takeaway. I love it when I see that happening. Yeah, and don't you think it's that, like you said, the peer and the collegial re relationships that students get within their working in projects together, and they're continually being cohorted into different groups, because mm -hmm. that's many times um, going to become a work skill for them for the future. 
So why not just build that in to what they're doing when they're in school? I'm, I'm always thinking about this and I think about, you know, and we had over 1 million openings for teachers this past school year, but we only graduated about 60,000 graduates from colleges of education across the US. Well, you see the problem right there. So how do we, how do we fill that gap? And that's why I think about, we may need to think about, um, I mean, more of a two year associates degree, right? And can we use some of those teachers to be more of a homeroom teacher? And maybe we have 50 or 60 students within a large room where we have lots of things going on. We have a study space over here. We might have some virtual um, video spaces where students can go to class and be cohorted with other students at other campuses across the district or across the state. But I also think about how can we have our highly qualified teachers, and we have so many passionate, great teachers in this country, and they're highly qualified, many of them masters, advanced masters and doctorates in education and in pedagogy. So they know their stuff and they're very good at it, but they, they have the capability of shifting and saying, you know what, let's grab this 10 students and get them pushed along. And then we're gonna just do 20 minutes with them and then cohort, oh, we have this 20 students that we can have with that same teacher 20 minutes later and, and get them going and just have those teachers be that, that, that spark underneath of them, you know, because you know those teachers just like I do, right? And we're just in awe, you know, the middle school teacher you referred to at Jack Swigert, she's one that could probably go from cohort to cohort to cohort of students and just spark, keep sparking students. But yet as a district, we have the technology that can give us those reports to know where yes. students are at all times. I mean, that's the power of technology. It is, yeah. Student information systems have come a long way in order to be able to provide that type of documentation and almost real-time reporting so that you know who you need to focus on and who's doing well. And again, those ones that are doing well, how do we leverage them to maybe help the ones that aren't doing as well? Right. Um, because it, it it's that whole um, process. We're not just building um, good workers and good employees. We're building good citizens, and that's a big, big part of it. I love that. Love that. Well, folks, um, you, you guys know what time it is. Um, Kathy and Mary do not. So we're going to surprise them here in a moment. But I do want to remind you, links down below, as well as the Ask Us Anything, please do ask your questions and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, so Mary, Kathy, um, as you just heard, there's something that I like to end every podcast with. And since you both are newbies, I have a feeling you don't know what that is. Um, so if you're like me, last night or, or, or over this last week, you've been thinking, Oh, okay, I've got that podcast. Danny's going to ask me this, or we're going to talk about this, and this is how I'm going to answer that question. And inevitably, because I am who I am, I didn't, I didn't ask you that question, or I didn't phrase it the same way, or, or that, that answer just never came out. So this is your opportunity to go freestyle. What is the one thing that you wished you could have talked about today that you want the audience to know? Or even if everything that you wanted to say you've said, what is the key piece that our audience should walk away from this podcast with? And I will let either one of you jump right in or I'm going to pick on you if you're not ready. I can go. I Go for it. <laughs> I love it. Um, my passion, I'm back to, I, I love working with students. And I, the one thing that I want people to understand is that um, it's so important to always accept people for who they are, for what they know. Don't judge them if they don't know something and you think poorly of them and don't judge them opposite that they're, they seem to be smarter and feel um, jealous of them. Be comfortable with who you are, be comfortable with who they are, and realize that all of us together make up a great, great community. And we can do so much when we work together. Um, I, I I always struggle with this because I, I, I'd like to work with students that are, and kids, and actually adults too, who seem to struggle with things a little bit more. Um, I, my heart goes out to them. I have empathy for them. Um, and I, and I want, I want to help them. I had a conversation with somebody just the other day who was totally opposite. He gets very frustrated with them. So, um, the, he, it's, when he gets like that, he, he tends to walk away. And so on the other side of this, where I sit there and say, be comfortable with who you are and don't judge people. 
when you feel like you're being judged, don't think you are. Be comfortable with who you are and don't um, sit there and think that because they think I don't understand this or I may not be able to, to do it or, hey, they think I'm really smart and I'm really good at this. Either way, it doesn't change who you are or what your, what your skills are. You should still do what makes you happy and what makes you a good citizen is, is the way I'm going to say it. Um, because I, I've run into a lot of people that sit there and they think they're better than I am. I get the impression. They think they're better than I am. That they're always talking down to me. Um, and they don't want to listen to me. And it it's kind of frustrating when that happens because um, I think that together all of us can work a lot better. Um, we can come up with better solutions. We can make it to the moon. Um, and if we don't value everybody, in, in everybody including yourself you've got to value them for who they are not who you want them to be or how they make you feel i love that Gosh, right. i keep learning more and more about kathy every day right <laughs> i mean i didn't know she was native to colorado springs and so that that's you know so now there's even more but as i take that question you know and i'm going to take it first of all um from the perspective of an educator that has really worked at administrating um, programs and um, pedagogical programs that include technology and mostly synchronous and asynchronous video. It is about the power of the network, you know, and we, we kind of opened that question today um, is how do I look at the power of the network and, and the security of our network? And that's important. And I also think about the power of collaborative tools. And I'm, and I'm being very careful about that because collaboration in a technical perspective is way different than what maybe a teacher would think about. When a teacher, when we say collaborate, they think, oh, we're going to get together and work on this together. That's what they think about collaboration. So I always say it's about the, you know, having that digital front door of using collaboration, whether it's messaging, whether it's a contact center, whether it's your calling features, all of those collaborations coming together truly what lay a great foundation within our school districts of the technology that's needed to provide the programs for students and to become innovative to really push the boundaries on innovative programs that students need for career and college and i put career first because it's important for me to say that it's about the soft skills that students need as they're going through the educational environment of how to work together, of how to have that presence of being, you know, um, presenting with other people on a team in a work field environment. But it's also building their passions so that if they do go on to college and extra educational opportunities, it is for their career that they want to have. And they probably want multiple careers. But of course, I think that that's where we um, really think differently is we're always pushing those limits. And so I look at programs like what Kathy has done and other school districts that I've worked with that, you know, they put in a runway for aeronautical engineering in a, in a high school innovation platform. I'm working with a school district in Illinois that put in building automation systems as a, cur a curriculum choice right along with Cisco networking academies and so that you know we can they, they have to have a basic knowledge of the network to be able to do building automation i mean so i'm always looking at school districts that are are really addressing the needs of their community by helping students figure out career options and of course i mean i my my good friend ken spellman here in omaha nebraska who is in charge of career tech ed I mean, he would be so proud that I brought that up, but it's so important that we really do think of careers for our students. Well, um, I, 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 you know, I normally do this a little bit in reverse, but uh, I just, I have to thank you both. Uh, seriously, I learned a lot and this was, this was a blast. I absolutely enjoyed this immensely. Uh, and I think the audience did as, as well. So seriously, thank you. Thank you for joining me today on this, on this Coffee and Conversations. Folks, uh, you. if you haven't done so already, please go down, check out those links, ask us your questions. I promise you we'll get back to you. And as always, thank you. Wherever, whenever, and however you joined us, we'll see you in the next one. Bye, folks.
Thank you.